when I was thinking about our next way to take Christmas, we're, we're thinking about the Advent season, and we're doing hope, peace, joy, and love. When I was thinking about peace, it is not just one thing. Peace on earth is kind of when uh, nations run out of bullets and they have to stop and rearm. That's the best we can do for peace here. But when you get to the biblical idea of peace, there are so many aspects to it that you can't say it's just one thing. It's composed of a lot. And I had this silly idea as I was preparing and studying and thinking, is there such a thing as a Christmas enchilada? Only one person is laughing here. I meant that half seriously. But when you think about an enchilada, it's not just one thing. You've got your chili Colorado, you've got your rice, refried beans, sour cream, guacamole, your peppers, jalapenos, right? Because if you don't have them, like, what do you have? And then it's got to have the soft tortilla with maybe a little bit more added. But when you walk up to the counter, you don't say, can I please have, you know, chili Colorado and the sour cream and the guacamole and the, and the, and the, and the. You say, can I have an enchilada? And we have that saying, the whole enchilada, which means all the parts gathered up into one. And it's, it's all the aspects that make an enchilada groovy <laughs> and tasty and life-giving. Now, I hope nobody's thinking desperately about lunch. <laughs> but peace... When you think about the word peace, don't think about one thing. Think about the whole enchilada. Everything that has to do with peace, and that's what we're going to be looking at in these scriptures. We're in Luke chapter 1. And we're just going to be taking the last bit in verse 76. If you have your Bible, open it up, and we're going to look at the ingredients of peace. So, in Luke 1, verse 76, Holly, I think Mrs. Risby wants to look on with you. There you go. So, verse 76 in Luke 1, everybody there? It says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest. For you will be go, go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So, in order to better understand things, it often helps to look at the opposite of what we're considering. And I wanted to start with that first. Look what happens when you invert these things. When you're saved, that is in verse 77, he's talking about knowledge of salvation. Salvation is a big word that just means saving. And when you're saved, you're drawn out of danger. That's the opposite of being saved, is being in danger. And that means in danger of injury and harm and loss. We know what it's like to be injured, right? To be in a bicycle accident, to get one's leg broken, to have a life-threatening disease to be in financial problems. So that's danger. And the danger that we're considering is far beyond 
even falling off a bicycle at high speed. Because the opposite of the remission of sins, the opposite of tender mercy, is vengeance. And that means receiving the reward or the punishment that's deserved. So when we're talking about vengeance, that means that a righteous penalty is going to be given out. God is going to judge the world in righteousness the way he sees things as fair and right. So it doesn't even depend on what I think. It depends on what God thinks. And the question is, did we do what is right all of our lives? What do we deserve for how we live our lives? I put uh, a whole list of accusations from God in the bulletin from Romans chapter 3 verses 9 to 20 and you know it begins with there is no one good no not one and it ends with this their feet are swift to shed blood destruction and misery are in their ways and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So what Paul is saying in that first three chapters of Romans is that there is no one who is good. And if we think about how God is going to repay the world, that means with vengeance. And there is no mercy in vengeance. It means paying back what a person deserves because of their actions. Then look at the last part of verses 78 and then 79. Visiting, coming and being with us, giving light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet. You know, this situation of danger and vengeance comes down to this being without God because that's the opposite of visiting and being with somebody is nobody is there the opposite of giving light is this darkness and then when you have a guide that's somebody who knows where they're going who can get you to a place you've never been who says come with me, even hold my hand, I'll get you there. And it's great to have a guide. But this is being alone, in darkness, not knowing the right way, and to be lost without peace. Now, this is the situation that is addressed by peace. You need more than just, oh well, you know, I'm doing okay. There's this idea of our relationship with God that must be addressed because he is going to judge the world in righteousness and in vengeance, pay back to people what they deserve. And this is hanging over everybody's head. Now, some people would, would listen to this and say, ah, it's kind of extreme. I'm doing okay. I don't, I don't feel like anything is wrong. My life is not that bad. But you know, there are some diseases that will affect one's nerves so that the, the disease is working and it's life-threatening, but you don't feel it. You might feel a numbness, but that's because the nerves are being destroyed. And usually they should send you the warning. Something is wrong. You need to deal with this right now. But you don't get that message. And if you don't feel like anything's going on, we're okay. The only, the only question you might have is if you were used to feeling something, and now you don't anymore, now you know, mm, I must be in trouble just because you don't feel. But you know, 
Some people don't feel anything. They don't feel guilty. You'll tell them, Jesus came to die for your sins. And they go, don't have any, mate. I, I don't relate to that stuff. I don't feel that. Now, I've thought about the times I haven't had a whole lot of money. And I haven't worried. Because, well, don't have any need. But then I get some bills. And then I realize, I have a need. I am in danger. Because I owe, and I don't have anything to pay that with. That's where I feel anxious. Have you ever felt that way? Suddenly you have a reason to fear. You go, not enough. But this is the danger that we're in. Because what God requires, what we owe him, is a life of righteousness. That's what he requires. What if we can't pay it? It's not a question of, well, here's all the righteousness I have. It's just a little bit. Is that enough? Tell that to somebody you owe money. Tell that to your credit card provider. Here's a little bit. Will that help? No, they say. We're going to add the interest on this month and add it next month and add it next month and you don't have anything to pay. How do you feel now? But credit cards are nothing compared to God. God requires righteousness and we have none. Because Paul says, there is none righteous. No, not one. So, sin doesn't seem all that bad. It seems kind of like an abstract sort of philosophic concept until you realize you need it and you haven't got any. You have to be aware of the danger or else none of these things about peace is going to make sense. You'll say, oh, well, yeah, sounds like a great thing, but you know, I'm doing okay, don't need peace, whatever. Or I already got it. I already got a certain amount of peace. Like when I turn off the television, then I got peace. That's good enough for me. We're fine. But we are indebted to God. And we have nothing to give him. And that's why it says in Isaiah that there is no peace for the wicked. And this is it. it it's compared to like waves coming into the shore. You ever stood on you know, the beach and you see the waves coming in and I wish it could be like you know, the travel pictures show you the turquoise water and it's clear right up to that perfect sandy beach and we go down, you know, to Brighton, stand on the pebbles and watch the water come in. And it's not pretty water. It's, you can't, you can't see through it because it has stuff in it. And it has, you know, organic matter and dirt in it because it's crashing and you wouldn't want to drink it, would you? See, this is the thing about the water that's always in motion. It's always kicking up muck. And that's what God says. That's, that's what people separated from God are like they just don't have peace. Now this is why Christmas is worth celebrating. Because with Christmas you get peace. And first of all, it's because Jesus makes peace. Now the context for these scriptures that we're looking at is Zacharias is talking to his son that's just been born. And an angel told him, you're going to have a son. And he said, you know what? I'm past it. I'm too old for this stuff. How am I going to know this is going to happen? And the angel says, you're not going to talk for the next nine months. That's how you're going to know. He comes out of the temple and they say, what happened? 
You're kind of agitated. What happened? <laughs> then he has to go home and tell his wife. <laughs> Somehow, we're going to have a we're going to have a son. She goes, "I don't know, man. I don't know about you. You can't talk and you're making these funny signals to me." <laughs> But then, you know, she does conceive. And he has a son right there and he can talk. And he's talking to his son and he says, "You child are going to be the prophet of the highest." Now that's the Messiah, but look at these names. The highest. The most high. Who is that? That is God. And look at the next name. You will go before the face of the Lord. That is the covenant name of God. But then look at this, the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us. Now, he's not talking about an angel. He's talking about God himself coming down and becoming one of us. Now, This whole thing about light is interesting because the Bible says that God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. That is who this child is going to be the prophet for, God. Now the prophets himself, the prophets say that God, the Messiah is God. This isn't just a Christian thing. Did you know that? The Christians didn't make it up. It's in the prophets. I talk to people all the time who say they believe the prophets. And I go, "Hey, I believe the prophets too." And I say, "Did you know that the prophets say that the Messiah is God?" And it's the scriptures that we sang this morning. That is in Isaiah 9. The names given to the Messiah are wonderful, which means miracle. Did you know a miracle is the power of God coming into human existence? So you have wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. The Messiah who will be born is God. Now Christmas is about peace because it's about what the Messiah Jesus has done to make peace. Because this peace, the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of sins. This knowledge is not just intellectual, but it's an experience. That is You know that you're a sinner. You know that you deserve vengeance from God. Cuz you know you haven't lived perfectly. You haven't lived a righteous life. You know that you've lied, you've stolen, you have envied, you've coveted. You've done stuff. And you say, "Well, I'm only human." But again, everybody does it. You know you aren't perfect. And if you get what you deserve from God, you know he's going to punish you forever. You deserve that. If you think about that for a while, you could get discouraged, couldn't you? There's a little heaviness in the room right now. But what happens if Jesus says to you your sins are forgiven then you go wow really and you start to feel light now this is what Jesus did while he was here on the planet you remember the time that they're in a house it's a little bit crowded nobody can get in So these guys decide they're going to dig through the roof and take off the tiles and lower their friend in on a blanket or something in front of Jesus. 
Everybody's watching this, and Jesus says, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And everybody in the room goes, <clears throat> Because only God can forgive sins. And some people are thinking, Who is this guy? Who does he think he is? That he can forgive sins. And Jesus then says, because nobody said anything, he says, what do you think is easier? To say, your sins are forgiven you? Or get up and walk? So that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I say to you, rise up and walk. Take up your bed and go home. So the guy goes, Okay, I will. Rolls up his bed, goes out, I'm leaving, bye. Everybody goes, whoa. But see, what that proves is he has the authority to forgive sins because he's God. How about the time when he's in the temple and he's teaching and these religious leaders bring in a woman and put her at his feet and say, you know what? We just caught her committing adultery in the very act. Now Moses says, you stone such people. What do you say? So they got him in a trap. If he says, don't stone her, then they say, well, you're breaking the law of Moses. And if he says, stone her, it's not very merciful, is it? So they think they, think they got him. So he's just kind of writing on the ground, and they say, well, what do you say? And he says, the one without sin can throw the first stone. <laughs> Goes back to writing on the ground. He's not kind of looking at him. And they all get the cue, and they all fade out. And he's busy not looking. He ain't, he's not looking at him. He's not looking daggers at him. He's just kind of fussing with the ground, kind of cleaning that up there. And he looks around and he says, where are your accusers, woman? She says, I don't have any. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, you could walk around and say to people, well, dear, your sins are forgiven you. And you could say, thanks a lot. Whoop-de-doo. Because nobody can really forgive sins except God. But what Jesus proved over and over again, he says, I can do that. How about while he's being crucified? And the guy next to him, dying, says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, truly I say to you, tonight you're going to be with me in paradise. He saves somebody while he's dying. So, here are people who are caught. They're dying. They know they deserve to die. And Jesus says to them, I forgive your sins. You're not going to die. Now, the next aspect to this peace, along with forgiveness, is this tender mercy. Doesn't that sound fabulous? I would take tender mercy any day over Chile, Colorado. <laughs> and that's saying something. But look where this forgiveness is coming from. Look where this tender mercy is coming from. The God who would give his own son to die in our place. That means that the Father loves us so much and he wants to save us to the point where he would give up his son to be born as a human being and die in our place. 
Do we understand that kind of love? It kind of goes right over our heads. We wouldn't do that. I'm not going to give up my kids. And they couldn't do anything anyway. And yet, here's Jesus. Here's the one who could say, I can throw that first stone. And when I throw this stone, you're dead. Because I don't have any sin. He's the one that could condemn us all. And he says, I will take your place and I will take all of your punishment upon me so that there is no condemnation for you. That's tender mercy. That's saying, I would rather suffer in my self than see you go through that. So here is tender mercy so that we can experience this forgiveness where God himself says, I forgive you. And then you think about the day spring from on, a, on high coming out of heaven to be with us. Now, if we were to get the sun, and I'm talking about that giant ball of burning gas, fission and hydrogen and nuclear reactions that give us a sunburn from 93 million miles away, <laughs> If you could get that sun to be with you and walk around with you, would you ever worry about being lost in the dark? You'd have this incredible light. And this is something that God brings into the blessing that was given to Aaron, the high priest, to bless the sons of Israel. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. So imagine this, this radiant light coming from God, coming into every part of our lives. We don't have to live in darkness. And that's especially good for plants. Plants don't do so good growing in the dark. And the scriptures again in Isaiah say that he will make us plantings of the Lord, oaks of righteousness. But you put an oak in the dark, and it'll die. It needs that sunlight. So God says, yes, I will be that light. I will give the light of life to be with us. And then he's guiding our feet into the way of peace. He, he will even say, not that way. Not that way. I want you to go this way guiding our feet so we don't get lost. We don't walk in darkness. So think about summing up all these things into one whole and it's peace. Peace because of our sins. Peace because we live in the light. And we don't experience that vengeance and condemnation of God. And it's being with God. So, that's what Christmas is about. All of this becoming reality in our lives. So, think about this. If you don't have Jesus today, you are lost. Not a little bit in the light, but totally in darkness and under the condemnation of God. And maybe even no feeling because that's what sin does. Sin kind of makes you numb to you say, well, I don't feel anything. But that doesn't mean you're well. That just means you can't feel it. You're just as dead. But here's about Christmas. It's about giving and gifts. And you can receive the greatest gift. In John 
chapter 1, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So here's a right that God gives at Christmas time to be called a child of God, born again, new life. And this is something that we can do. We can come to God and say that. That's what I want. I want to be born again. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So, if you have received Jesus, you get to have Christmas every day. It's not reserved for one month of the year that the season starts in October. <laughs> that's, that's not enough Christmas. You've got to have it every day. That sunrise from on high, the day spring, but you know, what's possible to do is to guess drift and get far from the Lord. I've gone through times like that. Your quiet times are not very satisfying. You just kind of get strung out. And then you're not even aware of it. And then you do something stupid. You sin. And there you are in the dark. And you're feeling anxious. You feel condemned and alone. You know, this is why Jesus came to us, is to give us the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of our sins. And it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so we don't have to feel like, oh, I can't come to God. I got to stay in the dark. I got to, you know, beat myself until I show God I'm really sorry this time. That's a waste of time. We can come to Jesus and just say, you know what? Guide my feet into the path of peace. And he will do it. Because that sacrifice is eternal. It's not just for once, it's forever. And that's how he keeps us. The only mistake we can make is by not coming to him. and Thinking, well, I gotta do this on my own. I gotta make it somehow and prove to him I really count or care or I can really do this. You know what, if you could do that, then Jesus died for nothing. He died for us because there was no other way to have peace with God. So the mistake we make is not coming to Jesus. We can come to him. And then, you know what? We got peace with God. That's what Paul says in Romans 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We don't have to live in, oh, I think God kind of hates me. I kind of hate me, so I'm sure God does too. Nope. Paul says we have peace because we have been declared righteous because we trust in Jesus. So we get to have peace even when we don't feel like it. Say, Lord, you justified me because I believe in Jesus. So can I have peace now? You know what you find out? Peace is a person. Just as we have a living hope, that's 1 Peter 1, we also have a living peace. He is our peace. So then we have peace to uh, go out to others. We can be those that make peace. We're supposed to be those people all around us. There are people in the dark, people who don't even feel the corruption of sin. If you ask them how you're doing, they go, okay, I'm doing all right. But you know, they're in the dark. And so we can go to them and give them the light of life. Because for people, 
Christmas is a really weird time. A lot of people, I, I was reading how people celebrate Christmas. And they go, well, we have our traditions. And we watch this game and we, you know, hide the pickle on the tree. and uh, Not my family's traditions, but they do all sorts of stuff. And, and nobody, nobody troll me because, you know, I'm an atheist. But I still celebrate Christmas. But I don't do any of that religious stuff. We just do presents and a lot of good food. And, but people feel weird because they feel like they ought to be happier somehow. It is Christmas, but it's so dark. Of course, there's the, the guys in Australia. It's right in the middle of summertime. So they have barbecues at Christmas time and play cricket on the lawn. You know, it's not our experience. But you know, people are dark and lost without Jesus, period. Think about that the next time you're in a grocery store. Everybody around me is lost. Everybody in this parking lot with me is lost. Everybody on the bus is lost. They're all lost. So one thing that Jesus wants at Christmas time is to guide people into the path of peace. That's what he died for. So we want to be aware of that. He is the only hope of peace in the world. Period. Governments can't bring peace. Businesses can't bring peace. Sorry, Amazon. You can't get peace online. Only Jesus. So, we leave it at that. Shall we pray? Boy, I am sure glad for peace today. Because, Lord, if you would mark sins, who could stand? All of our righteousness is like a filthy rag And we need to know that forgiveness of our sins. I know that some people don't have that. They don't know if their sins are forgiven. And the only way to do that is to come to Jesus and receive him. So I, I want to pray this morning for people that need to receive Jesus. Heavenly Father, draw people to Jesus. And help them to have peace when they receive him. But Lord, not one second before. Because you said that that, that name of Jesus is the only name given by which we must be saved. There is no other. So Lord, now we want to come. We want our sins forgiven. Not because we're anything, but because Jesus died in our place. Wash and cleanse today. Bless this Christmas, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, 